Hello, good afternoon, and welcome. It is the THCB Gang episode number seven uh, on today, which is April the 30th, last day of the month, if I got my numbers right. It's about 30 days of September, April. Yep, 30 days of April. And we are, have a great group today. I've got a couple of special guests on today, along with some of the uh, uh, old lag regulars. Um, so who are we at today? So we have guests. Raj Agarwal. Raj is a, uh, you're, you, the, he's at least filling the quota of British accented, you know, definitely Indian doctors from the Philadelphia area, <laughs> voicing uh, his buddy, uh, Sarab, Ra, Sarab Shah. Raj is uh, also, he, he's a GI surgeon who is the head, heads up in the sort of innovation investment arm at Jefferson Health System in Philadelphia. Grace Cordovano, a patient advocate, board set by patient advocate from uh, the New Jersey area. Um, my, Jessica the Massa, uh, well known to most people who hang out with me because she and I do the Health in 2.0 show. It's her first time on the TCB gang, even though TCB gang was actually her idea. Uh, Michael Melanson, health quality advisor in Chicago, but also the uh, author of Demanding, way back when, now 25 years ago, the author of Demanding Medical Excellence, a great book about the evolution of medical quality. And Ian Morrison, my former boss at IFTF, well known healthcare futurist at Second Curve, coming in from Menlo Park. So here we go, everyone's gonna come up and I'm gonna start off by asking everybody uh, what they saw this week as craziness continues on. So let's start with you, Ian. What, what was new and different this week that you saw? Um, well, I spent, you know, I've been sort of obsessing about the financial hydraulics, as you know, in the last few weeks, but uh, um, I was on a couple of webinars listening to uh, uh, employers' perspective at PBGH and then the actuaries at Millman talking about commercial uh, the effects of COVID, which I thought was fascinating and, and sort of directionally correct. That the punchline being um, is the old game of paying a lot of money on a commercial basis for surgical services to keep the healthcare system afloat going to be sustainable post COVID. Fair enough. Uh, Grace, what are you seeing this week? Okay, well, I guess we all saw that Vice President Mike Pence didn't wear a mask at Mayo Clinic. <laughs> And I'm not one to stir the pot on the politics thing, but I have families who are banned and prohibited from visiting their loved ones, families who have loved ones who are dying, who are saying goodbye via FaceTime, uh, who can't come in even if they bring a mask. So that was a hot button item for me. And we talked about grandchildren being able to hug their grandparents and Switzerland, Daniel Koch, I believe, infectious disease chief of Switzerland, um, let out a press release that grandparents can give their, their grandkids uh, brief hugs. So that, uh, I'd like to talk about that a little bit more and what data so we they, do so and don't have hold, there. So long as they hold their breath, right? <laughs> All right. Um, Jessica, uh, what do you notice particularly this week? Uh, I've been uh, traversing the world of telehealth. So I've been, um, I've interviewed Ginger's CEO, Russell Glass. Um, they're a, a behavioral health uh, telehealth company and they're talking about how their usage has gone up 140% over the last two months. And a lot of the people who are using, um, they've actually done a survey. Uh, they re, they re-ran a workforce attitude survey. And so they, they, um, asked their employee populations, you know, about how stressful this time is. And what they've heard back is that most people are saying it's five times more stressful than the 2008 financial crisis. 70% um, are saying it's the most stressful time in their career. Um, so they're seeing a big uptick. And what's interesting is they've, um, they've noticed along gender lines that men are not handling this nearly as well as women. <laughs> No, truly. And it, the problem is work from home. So it's like um, men are not used to dealing with the burdens of both being at home and dealing with the kids and doing their job at the same time. And they're, they're missing more hours of work. The reporting being more stressed out. So yeah, really interesting stuff that they've had to report on that. And then in the bigger market, I'm watching Teladoc stock go up. Mm to 200 uh, on Tuesday, and now it is 164. So I have to check out that earnings report that went out last night after market. Meant to go short at 200, damn it. I, knew it was something I forgot to do. I, I kind of I thought that too. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, Raj, do it real quick. We'll get into what, what you're seeing in the big picture, but what did you notice in the last week? Yeah, um, I, I actually follow on from what Jess just said. Uh, I did get on that earnings call with Teladoc uh, last night. And uh, you know they've got a increase of 40% uh, in terms of their uh, uh, revenue and uh, I think 90% in terms of their, their visits. And uh, 
you know, so that's remarkable. Let me just add a personal element to this. So earlier this week, I was feeling terrible. Um, I had uh, streaming eyes and headache and sinus pain. I get really bad allergies. Philadelphia is bad for allergies. I called up our Jeff Connect teledoc uh, platform. Um, and obviously, you know, the primary care doc there said, go and get tested. Um, we don't want you to be uh, uh, giving this to any other patients and so forth. Uh, obviously, I'm a practicing physician. So that worked perfectly. Within three minutes, I was online and it was great. It took me two hours from the time I arrived at the testing site to actually then get my test. And the reason was that the test order was put in our EMR and the hospital I went to to get my test isn't on that EMR across our system. It had to be hard faxed across and all this kind of stuff. It just made me realize that whilst we can have a digital front door and all that kind of stuff is great, yeah. customer experience still needs improvement and that connectivity, um, you know, it was just like frontline. I was like, wow. Oh, interoperability. Interoperability. <laughs> 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 oh, oh my God. Wait, positively so mid, <laughs> right? I, I, I knock it. So one, of, we, we were kidding on this health and two yesterday. One of my former interns, actually not even my intern, somebody who worked for me as intern, okay, Kim Kruger, we used to call the guy, but Kim Turn, Troy Bannister, got funded like 12 million bucks for a new interoperability company just yesterday. Um, oh, uh, particle cool. health. So maybe they're going to come and save you. Maybe not. We'll see. Michael, this week, what did you notice? Well, first I want to uh, build actually uh, one of the things to you know on what uh, Raj said is that there's a, uh, a local informatics physician I've been trying to uh, help get some attention to the idea of just uh, having on top of the EHR um, a, 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 a sort of a, a registry of who's been tested by using the same uh, kinds of uh, inputs that they have to do now for opioids and for other prescribed substance, right? Easy, put it in, get exactly what you're talking about. Maybe you and I can talk later. I tried to get this to the political folks in Illinois and to New York with no, uh, with no success. Maybe we can do that off, offline, Raj. The, the thing I saw the most depressing survey from Kaiser Family Foundation, and they asked healthcare workers about social distancing and this kind of, uh, uh, all these rest of things. And this should be the most non-political question in a, in a pandemic, right? Whether you're a healthcare worker in Utah and Georgia or in downtown uh, New York, social distancing and distancing yourself in a pandemic should be completely apolitical. And it turns out it broke down along party lines, right? That, that whether they thought it was done or not. And this, this bespeaks uh, how the difference between Republicans and Democrats is no longer about political philosophy, but do you belong to the cult of Trump or do you not belong to the cult of Trump? And if the cult of Trump says it's okay to use Lysol, then you immediately either say it is or he was kidding. And if you don't, you go, what is he, nuts? And, and, and so science, even for people who are involved in their own lives being at risk, uh, becomes what does the cult leader say? Uh, and that was a little bit, a little bit jarring. I think the cult leader is currently saying, "Storm the Michigan Senate with your AK-47, with your AR-16, which is pretty scary." Um, uh, what did I notice this week? Well, I noticed uh, my my fun stuff, which is that this time Johns Hopkins, possibly the greatest, uh, you know, best-known hospital in, in the country, and certainly one of the, the where surgeon surgery was originated in the U.S., is also joined the joined the uh, joined the group of, of hospitals who decided to be. Um, uh, 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 I've not forgotten the word. When you take garnish when garnishing wages out of very poor people who couldn't afford their bills, they were reported on by ProPublica. So that's still happening in the middle of the pandemic. And luckily, right. luckily they, they stopped when they were called on it by ProPublica. But, you know, some of this really bad behavior is going on. And the other thing I noticed was uh, 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 that there was a report out showing that half of the collapse in economic activity that we've seen in the first quarter, so on the second quarter, but to the end of March, was in healthcare, just a reduction of spend in healthcare. I don't think healthcare has gone up in recession to the year before, so maybe healthcare is going to go down as a share of GDP because of this. Who knows? It's, it's kind of crazy. Anyway, well, that, that's a, a fun, fun way to start the opening round. A lot of topics there, but I do want to ask Raj, as we have a, as, as a guest this week, uh, a little bit about what you're seeing on the ground at Jefferson. What's the state of play in Philadelphia? Tell us a bit about the Jefferson system. I think it's, it's a pretty big system, but it's not, it's, it's, uh, not, not necessarily that well known outside of the, uh, the Northeast. And tell us a bit about what's going on in terms of the COVID treatment there and how everything else is being impacted. Yeah, no, Matt, uh, thank you. Um, uh, really appreciate the opportunity and to, to join all of you um, on this as a guest. You don't have to be that polite on the THCB gang. Just don't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have got my beers in. 
Um, uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, Jefferson, uh, I've been here three years. Uh, I'm the EVP for Strategic Ventures um, here at Jefferson. Um, our CEO, Steve Klesko, um, came here six years ago um, and uh, really had a mission to transform healthcare. Um, and the, the underpinning of this mission is you know, what he calls healthcare with no address. So where is Jefferson? It's not bricks and mortar. It's wherever um, you need to be delivered uh, care. And so, you know, the, the onward approach of that is, you know, we think about the hub of uh, the main hospital, and then we think of the spokes around community hospitals, really focusing around the hub being the patient, right? The person who needs care being the hub, and everything else works around um, that hub. So Steve came, uh, it was a three hospital, $1.5 billion health system. And over the last uh, four or five years, a lot of M&A activity has led to it now being uh, just north of 5 billion, 14 um, hospital system. Um, you know, covers all the specialties as you could imagine. Um, and we're just in the process of closing a deal uh, to acquire Fox Chase Cancer Center as well, uh, just in the north of Philadelphia as well. So there's been a lot of activity. And in the midst of all of that, I mean, it's interesting of the timing just six months ago was when Hahnemann Hospital uh, closed that I'm sure many of you have heard about. And just imagine if that would have happened right now around COVID and so forth. Um, uh, it, it's just mind boggling. You know, it was very, very close in terms of how that happened. So just pre-COVID, you know, we're one of the closest hospitals to Hahnemann. It's a 490-bed hospital. So in terms of just our um, OB uh, deliveries, uh, uh, they've doubled um, uh, over the last six months. In terms of our emergency um, room visits, they've gone up 40% uh, uh, because of uh, Hahnemann and maybe other factors as well. So we were already kind of in this situation where we were coping with more than um, our uh, fixed assets could be able to cope with. Um, in terms of the broader picture of uh, greater Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we've obviously not been hit as hard as um, our neighbors up in uh, New York and New Jersey, um, uh, though we have had a surge. Um, and really the, the aspects that we've really focused on, and I take zero credit for this, this is really the clinical leadership, is one was just getting stockpiles of the PPE equipment and getting that you know, six weeks ago. And um, I'll come to this, but also how we did that across a system. Um, and then the second thing is when we saw those cases come in uh, to the hospital, to the emergency rooms, uh, really making sure that uh, we could you know, cut off elective surgery. Um, March 16th was the last day that we did surgery. Um, and then really, you know, position ourselves in terms of our, our staff, in terms of the space, um, you know, turning ORs into ICUs and so forth, and then having all the equipment, the stuff that we uh, needed to be able to do that. So we are, um, you know, fortunate that we've not had a situation where we have not had enough ventilators or ICU beds within our hospital. Um, but another part of this that, you know, I talked to our clinical leadership about just a couple of weeks ago was imagine if Jefferson wasn't this 14 hospital, $5 billion system and was five separate systems, you know, each of three hospitals here and three hospitals there. Could we have actually managed to be um, uh, uh, sufficient for ourselves in terms of this surge? And, you know, that, that's a rhetorical question. No one knows the answer to that. But what we really believe is that bringing together these um, uh, systems and bringing them together as a system approach has really shown, let me give you one example. In the last um, month, we've written 300 policies. That's the number of policies we write in a year, right? And so we've got everyone on board. And for each system, each three hospital system, whether it was our hospitals in New Jersey or in the North or so forth, to have done that to the quality and the level that we've managed to do that by coming together, I don't think would have been possible. So I think there's a real kind of um, engendering around this of our, um, of our employees, our leadership, that you know, we're not just a conglomeration of multiple systems that happen to be joined at the knee or the elbow and so forth. We've actually come together. And I think this has been a defining moment for us of saying, you know, what is one Jefferson and how do we perceive that across our system? So let me, let me stop there and uh, uh, you know, happy to take any more. I, 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 I'd ask, I mean, I'd say a couple of things. One is that you've got a pretty remarkable leader there. So your CEO, you know, talks, he talks a lot differently and seems to act a lot differently than a lot of other hospital CEOs do classical, right? So that, that's one thing. And, it, and the second thing is, you know, the bit that you're involved in, uh, in terms of outreach to smaller companies, outreach outside of the four walls of the hospital. Um, you know, there is an open question as to whether a hospital or a hospital system is the right entity to be doing that outreach in the community. And that, that will continue on my phone. We should get into that a bit here because I'm, I've been thinking a lot about that um, in the recent weeks. But, you know, the ability to do that involves putting into place a lot of different alliances and 
activities and you know role changes that hospitals traditionally haven't done very well. I mean, Ian, and Michael, we've been talking about this for 30 years, right? About how bad hospitals are at doing, doing community care. So put yourself outside of your job for a second, right? You do it, but give yourselves a score out of out, compared to the average hospital system that we and the other people you hang out with as to how much effort and time has been invested in doing that part of the role at Jefferson compared to you know putting an entire system together. Sorry, which, which part so of that? How, yeah. how far ahead of you are you on looking at the community, looking out to you know where the patient is, not getting them in the four walls, providing them services where they are, including remote monitoring, including you know at home care, all the stuff that we need to do for, for COVID. Um, I still think we're working on it, to be quite honest. Uh, I don't want to say that we're we're ahead of everyone else. I think there are uh, parts you mentioned, remote monitoring, um, you know. Uh, hospital at home, uh, kind of connected care and, uh, uh, you know, telehealth, all those kind of things. I think we're, we're in the mix with what I would say is the, uh, the leading systems across the country. And there are some things that we do, uh, do exceptionally well and happy to give a couple of examples on that. Um, and there are other areas where we look at other systems uh, to approach. So, you know, uh, I don't want to be arrogant on this. I think we're, we're doing a great job, but there's a huge amount of work to be done. And um, what I look at this is, you know, it's all about collaboration, right? So if we can learn something, I was on a call with one of the systems in New Jersey actually just yesterday, um, and we went up and visited them, uh, I don't know, two months ago. We shared what we were doing in half a day. They shared what they were doing. We had a follow-up call yesterday, and you know, the, my equivalent there said, hey, Raj, really like to look at number one, number two, and number four, and I'm really interested in you know, their number two and number seven in terms of what they're doing. So it really is about that kind of developing that partnership, um, both within and then from out with. So I want to flip it now. Grace, you've been living in the world of uh, being a patient of some of the stuff. We talked to her last week about your experience with your, with your getting your mother sort of outside the emergency room and not being, knowing who was doing what around the patient. Can you just respond to what Raj, react to what Raj is saying and give me, give me a sense about where you think the, you know, the, the typical patient with chronic illness is? Mm. So um, again, I'm in Northern New Jersey, hotspot area, and uh, from a patient perspective, so we've been thrown into this telehealth, telemedicine vortex, which patients who are chronically ill with multiple comorbidities have wanted for so long, but now we've cut all this red tape, so it's here, and I'm so triggered listening to your experience about lack of interoperability, because what I'm seeing is, this is great, we have this technology, but patients don't have their care partner with them because of sheltering in place. So the person that usually takes the reins isn't on the telehealth call or visit. Uh, they don't have access to their medical records because the patient portal is useless and it's empty and it doesn't have any of the information up to date or curated. So now also in all this digital health and te technology, whether it's a blood pressure cuff, whether it's a pulse oximeter, a thermometer, you'd be shocked how many people don't have access to all of that. So I walk a line where I, we talked about this, that I have the privilege of attending conferences and speaking at them. And I see these amazing exhibit halls with every technology known to man. But here I am in Northern New Jersey, where there are some of the most excellent healthcare delivery organizations, cancer centers and facilities. We don't have any of the technology. We're using a paper and pen. We can't access our medical records. I mean, I saw a local facility that was offering curbside medical records pickup. And I'm like, oh my God, what are we doing? I mean, this is good, but the, it's, it's I, I think like a, a horse and buggy in some places actually might work better than the processes that are in place. Now, granted, it is a pandemic, um, but I hope that when hospitals are doing these collaborations, um, I love that you're reaching out to hospitals here in New Jersey, and I love that there's information sharing happening, but I hope you're talking to the families and the patients, too, to bring those insights in so that we can do our work the way that we need to, so we can be compliant and adherent and all of those words, because we have, we have big jobs to do on top of the fact that we're all working from home and now homeschooling multiple children. Which is a very easy task, I've discovered. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my kids are going to be repeating kindergarten well especially the one, the one is in third grade is definitely repeating kindergarten next year. Uh, anyway, that, 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 that really well said there grace i think that, that's that's dead true i i'm so i'm involved with a, a, a another group which is morphing from being like a pressure group of anesthesiologists anesthesiologists um to try to actually instead get involved in the idea of, of can we do more remote monitoring there was a interesting piece that um 
Oh, bloody hell, help me somebody. The uh, head of uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation used to run the National Academy of Medicine. Feinberg. Feinberg. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Feinberg wrote uh, with Jordan Sainz and, and the guy who runs the World Bank about how do we do quarantine in a safe way? Right. And I've been thinking about this and saying, oh, what are the, we don't really have that organization yet. And I've written a piece about this, which will come out at some point. We don't really have that organization yet, which is putting together all the stuff we need. There have been people sent home in New York City or sent to hotels or sent home who didn't have pulse oxes, or if they did have a pulse mm -hmm. ox, didn't have anybody on the other end looking at the pulse ox, who decompensated and died having been sent home theoretically better with COVID. And I'm still wondering, and you know, about someone I grab Ian, you and Michael are to, to say a word or two about this. How close are we to thinking about how we change the, 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 not only the payment structure, the incentive structure, but also the underlying you know, organizational structure so that somebody, whether it's a Jefferson or one Jefferson or whether it's like a new entity yet to be formed or whether it's you know, Optum or someone is actually responsible for the, that real continuum that Grace is talking about. Because I still get the impression that right now we're sending patients home with basically nothing and hoping they'll call mm -hmm. their doctor if something goes wrong, as opposed mm -hmm. to using that, those tools that I, I've been banging on about this flipping the stack for several years now, me and Indu at Health 2.0, talking about you start with the technology infrastructure first that tracks you and monitors you. We are talking about, about contact tracing and doing that globally, but we haven't really talked about doing tracing, at the, you know, tra tracking and monitoring properly in the home mm -hmm. and getting it done. So it's all great to say about that, that we should have this thing, but you know, you, Ian, from your your sort of perspective, if you're talking, is anybody thinking about doing that at scale? Well, I, I think you're raising the right point here. And, and you know, I've been having a conversation with, with a bunch of my colleagues about this stuff. The, I mean, I go back to something I wrote years ago about the, the basic problem in American healthcare is that the metaphor is pimp my ride. You know, you take a <laughs> tired old chassis and you throw unbelievable technology at it, but you don't actually fix the engine, you know. Um, and I, I worry a little bit about when it comes to telehealth, it's a pimp my ride model of, of adding on to. And, I, uh, you know, I'm going to be a little bit sensitive here. I mean, I think there is an argument even amongst companies like Teladoc that is the future an episodic use of virtual care or is it Raj and his colleagues embedding those tools and technologies into an existing system and solving for Grace and her family's problem. Oh, you know, I, I think Raj, you know, when, when you and I were together back in Phoenix in January, you had talked about, you know, Steve had talked about just the degree to which some of your new ventures were responsible for financial flows in the system. And I think that's the breakthrough when we can actually see uh, the economics work by incorporating and serving patients and it really will require some kind of payment stream, prepayment stream to, to do that. But Michael, you, you had, I think, wanted to jump in here first. Yeah, so I, I, let's talk about money and power, right? So I'm a Marxist political scientist from Cambridge, as is Raj, by the way. So you're in the right place. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so look, uh, this is not, most people perceive, first of all, what we're seeing here as not a healthcare crisis, but a medical crisis. And therefore, what Grace said is absolutely makes sense and is very important, but the general perception is, in fact, if I get access to my doctor, everything will be okay. So nobody has the foggiest notion that I, as a patient, should have a caregiver or access to a port or a medical record or whatever, right? This is straight old fashioned medical, go to your doctor and you will be healed. The second thing is, is when you step back and you hear about telehealth and all the rest of that, it's being bought by healthcare systems and others. The return on investment is for them, right? And the return on investment for them is the throughput of the doctor or whatever. Nobody ever says, you know what? My return on investment should be to help share decision-making by my patients. My return on investment should be, you know, to, to get fewer surgeries because after all, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna make better decisions, right? So. That's kind of, you know, when we're talking about the power and the money, that's where it's concentrated. The public believes in access. The politicians see that their constituency is losing money because of lack of surgeries and other things. And some of that's legit and some of it is, you know, maybe they needed it, maybe they didn't. And so telehealth is, has always been an add-on 
uh, one of the things that I have been writing about for many years is we need to improve the quality of care, consistency, uh, systemic improvement. Telehealth is merely a telephone and a, and a camera to let me do what I always did. It doesn't say anything about the quality of care, the guidelines, good, bad, safe, unsafe. It's simply a distribution methodology. And the question is, you know, raised by all the panelists here, can we take what's happened in this pandemic and use it not just to change the distribution mechanism, but to make the quality better, more compassion and all the rest of that. And I think it's gonna take a little bit of time after the pandemic before we go from access is everything to how can we really be more compassionate? How can we be more efficient and effective? Raj. Yeah, no, I just wanna, I don't wanna be a downer on telehealth, but uh, it's the hot topic at the moment. And I was just reading a, a case study in Harvard Business Review just earlier this morning, actually, um, around um, Best Buy, right? And I'm sure a lot of you know about what Best right, Buy is right. healthcare, but you know, Best Buy in 2012 got a new CEO. It was, uh, everything was Amazon and you know, they, their business model was done. It was all bricks and mortar. You know, why would anyone invest anything in Best Buy? And they had a staged approach. I'm not gonna go through it all now, but they focused on their employees. They focused on right. what can they offer within that bricks and mortar that it can be, you know, uh, curbside pickup, which means something different right now. But, you know, you can order something and within 15 minutes, go and pick it up. You can right. go there and they opened up spaces where um, Microsoft and Google and Apple actually rented space within the Best Buy store to sell their stuff that you can buy online anyway, right? And then they had their geek squad and put all that together. So when we think about, you know, the traditional is going from Blockbuster to Netflix, and that's what healthcare needs to do and the digital front door, that is one part of it. Um, and I completely subscribe to Ian's, uh, you know, pimp my ride version of healthcare. But we need to also leverage all of the facilities that we have, the bricks and mortar, the patient um, uh, engagement, the doctors, the provider, everything that we have within our system. And we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and just go, oh, well, it's all digital health now. And everything's going to be run by, you know, these uh, incumbents that are going to come in and transform everything. I, I think that's wrong. I think it needs to be incremental and transformational, but it can't be everything that, that um, you know, everything that we have now can't be wrong. Let me put it that way. Jessica. I think um, from the startup side, the, so this conversation, um, the label for it, the, the word, the terminology that has been like, you know, the, the hot phrase of like the last couple of months has been infrastructure. So all the startups have been talking about infrastructure. There's no infrastructure. So it's like on, on the tech side of things, it's like they're out there with their blood pressure cuffs, their pulse axes, all this stuff, the telehealth, but it's like, like Raj, your experience or Grace, your experience, there's no way to get that stuff back in, into a way, into the health system where it makes sense or where it can augment the care that's already being delivered or it can be baked into the workflow processes that are already in place. So from, from the startup side, they've been clamoring for this. And I don't think anybody's really figured out how to do this in a way yet um, even how to lay lay the plans or the tracks for for some of this infrastructure to be built. I mean, if you imagine it like a, a highway system, it's like it, no, there's just a bunch of dirt roads after after a certain point. You know, you leave the healthcare system and that's it. You're on a path now. Good luck to you with your horse going through the desert. So I think um, what what needs to happen, I guess, I mean, from from that perspective, is I, I haven't seen anybody on the incumbent side really take a lead in building out a pathway for even just one digital solution to be baked in. And I think everybody's pinning their hopes on telehealth at this point. And you know, to Michael's point, it really is just the digitization of what we've already done. This is no different than making like, you know, the, the basics of like the EMR where it's just like now it's a digital record, but then eventually it's like, you can do some cool stuff with it and you can add things onto it, get some population health information, all of that. So it's like, I think that's where we're at on the, on the tech side of things is looking for someone to kind of, you know, from an incumbent organization, really set that pathway um, and build that infrastructure so that this stuff can come back in. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a critical point and we still don't really know the answer to that. And it's not clear even from the, 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 the point of view of the, of the current you know, growing fast tech companies, you mentioned Teladoc and Livongo and some of the others, <clears throat> as to exactly who their customer is. And I've been talking about this at, at Health 2.0 since, and Andrew and I have been talking about this since, since we started, right? Is this a new thing which is replacing the current incumbents? Or as Ian said, Health 2.0 about three or four years ago, is it that we add on to the current incumbents in the system, the stuff that required to do that? We haven't really figured out either one of those. Um, if you look well, at- Well, look at Optum right now. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's unclear as to, you know, how is this new thing being birthed? 
there is, and um, there are two quick things I, I want to say. One is I got in a little bit of a Twitter spat with, well, not spat, but a tw Twitter, Twitter discussion about what is, this actually let, not much of a spat for me, but a sensible discussion about what is going on. Within telehealth, right, there's a lot of stuff that is, doesn't have to be live. You know, there's a lot of stuff that can be done quick text that Jay Parkins has been doing that now crossover or his company can be done asynchronously. There are a bunch of companies selling this asynchronous stuff so I can basically fill in the form and get the med, the, the primary care, you know, med or whatever sent to me later. There's a bunch of telehealth going between specialists, uh, e-consults and what have you. There's a bunch of stuff that's not what we think of as the, the telehealth or the Amwell video model. And I think that's gonna, gonna, gonna start growing. So how we break out primary care and care coordination amongst that, and then so get it out to people who really need it, especially people with chronic illness or people at risk or people who are, you know, need to be hospital at home. We haven't figured that out enough and who's doing that and consumers don't yet understand it. As, uh, as Grayson, you've been saying, you have to call, you know, call your doctor rather than think about how to do this, you know, as a, as, a, as a system, as a process to be understand the way we kind of understand how we use Amazon now. And then the, the, other, the other point, which, which uh, you know, is, uh, continues to, to, to freak me out a little bit is that if you've got all of these different, um, uh, you know, entities trying to sort of clamor and figure it out and all the rest of it, who's actually in charge of the overall thing? <laughs> um, and that includes, so I just noticed that Andreessen Horowitz, you know, biggest, richest VC firm in Silicon Valley yesterday, funded an at-home delivery of DME company because that was done badly. But, you know, they're talking about doing primary care at home, but they haven't got the rest of it there. But there are probably six or seven or eight companies you've got to put together. So I'm, I'm, clam I'm still don't know who owns that. And in Helsinki, Finland, the government owns it. And they do most of this stuff together. But here we haven't got the, <clears throat> as Michael was talking about, politics and power. We haven't really figured out who does that. And everyone's still kind of predicting their turf. Anyway, Grace, come in and then uh, Ian. So I just want to make a comment that patients and their families know no one's coming to save them. You know, everybody, we've been left out of the picture. So peer health support groups are doing a tremendous job of putting this together. We're writing our own notes. We're writing our own guidelines. So what I've seen is hospitals are coming up with playbooks, how to manage COVID, how to treat, what the ICU needs to look like, how to do a digital playbook, wearables, remote patient monitoring. Patients are coming up with their own thing for what happens outside of the four walls of medicine, how to prep for going inside the four walls of medicine. The cystic fibrosis community has been uh, really savvy in a lot of the, the pulse ox work and has been sharing uh, different oncology and cancer patient support groups have been putting together materials and sharing it. And then now there's also this huge peer uh, health support group for the survivor core, which is COVID survivors and those who have recovered who are sharing what their patient reported outcomes or what their symptoms were. How did they know when to go to the hospital? How do you get into a trial? So, you know, we can't forget about that. There's a wealth of information that's happening there. And I would love to see the hospital side, the, the provider side, the delivery side, the technology side, and the patient and caregiver bring all of that together because I think those realizations and those levels of expertise together are the secret sauce. That strikes me is that we're talking about doing that we've had some attempt to do that you know online with the patients like me and other types of groups like that and the peer mm -hmm. support Susanna Fox I'm trying to get on the show at some point talks about that a lot but it's a real struggle and it's not mm -hmm. easy for most patients right I mean you're talking about patients having to leave this themselves and that's mm -hmm. not really how we do things in the rest of society we normally provide people with some guidelines of how to do that I mean we're not really doing it um Ian you've been talking a bit about primary care and uh, over the over the years and also the the recent collapse in the in the, the sort of the metrics and the, the finance buying primary care. Do you think we we can pin that right, or do you think we have to start again to do what Grace is talking about? How does it well, get them? I think that conversation connects to the one we just had, right? You know, yeah. it, it, you know, what, one of the things I've been sort of trying to speculate through is what happens to all those practices. Are we going to see further consolidation? Uh, either by private equity roll-ups who pick up the rabble that's left or uh, by hospital systems who, you know, take in the refugees. But I, I wanted to make two comments to sort of connect the thing. One is, I don't think it's going to be one answer. I think you're going to see the optimum. I mean, there's a, there's a model that says you need lives and you need doctors and you buy hospitals in the spot market, which is kind of optimum's uh, view of the, the universe. The, but then you've got leaders like like Raj and Steve at Jefferson who are saying, we're going to start with these physical assets 
and a traditional system, but virtualize it as fast as faster than the opposition to include, uh, you know, the kinds of capabilities that that we're all talking about. And I think, I think both things can be true, right? You know, I the, the one I'm least, and and maybe this is just my bias and lack of expertise that that Jess and you and others have. Um, is that the startups just become a gaggle of, of pilots that are not scalable and are competing for the attention and in some cases diverting attention by you know just nitpicking at CEOs to give me a shot. I think some hey. people are doing better than others at curating that. Um, I, but just one final piece and I'll, I'll throw it back to Jess. That, the building block, I think, is to go back to clinical processes that meet patients. I go back to my old management engineering unit roots and virtualize that care where you can. So it might not be Teladoc gets the business. It's embedding digital health into a work stream for looking after a patient with a set of conditions. I was going to ask you actually, um, and your point is perfect because I think what you're you're right about what you said about the startups being kind of a almost a distraction in the sense where it's just like that you know death by pilot situation. But I had an interesting conversation earlier this week with somebody who had said that they don't see this. Um, even the big startups, like the, the or the big tech companies that are in health, like the Teladox, they don't see even them the Lavongos being able to scale up without somebody bigger absorbing them and who they were looking at were the non-traditional healthcare players like okay CVS health or Walmart what's Walmart going to do or Amazon what's Amazon Amazon going to do and making an argument and I thought this was a pretty valid point you know I'd love to hear what you think about this really anybody on this call um but just you know is that really the way that some of this tech stuff gets scaled you know is it by these non-traditional healthcare players who have access to not just you know patients but the healthcare consumer you know, and generally speaking, and na nationwide, not in a small pocket, you know, you may own Philadelphia, or you may own New Jersey, or you may own the, you know, the Pacific Northwest, but it's like, really to achieve the kind of scale where um, the, the money is going to make a difference, the, the changes that are going to be need to be made to the infrastructure are going to be worthwhile. Do you need one of those big guys to come in and, and just own this? Well, I, I think that's what that's one possible future. And you know, I, I was involved with the CBS guys a year or so ago, and as they were putting that thing together a little bit. And and you know, I think there's a plausible play. But I come back to what Raj said earlier: not everything is going to be digital. You know, you're going to have. To, I mean, surgery is not going away, and you're not going to do ablations on your iPhone, but you could do heart monitoring of patients on your iPhone, right? And it's figuring out across clinical circumstances and workflow how to best embed technology and reconceive of care processes that are both patient-centric and digitally enabled. And I think where I see the most promise actually is, you know, is Raj and his colleagues because they're in that business, right? They're already there. I do think you're right, though, Jess, that there will, the, an Amazon is the one to watch, right? Well, I mean, is it the difference between, you know, acute, like the, the level of acuity of care, right? I mean, we're talking about primary care, which is where I, where I was saying that is. I mean, you're not going to do an ablation on your iPhone, but yeah. or a surgery or anything like that. But I mean, if we're talking about primary care, you know, there's a lot there to, to offload. Right. So, Raj, let's get you on this and then yeah, Michael. Can um, give let, the, me, uh, let me just some quality there. Ian, just made me think of uh, some work that we did gosh, 15 years ago now, um, uh, 2006, when I was back in London, uh, we did some work with the World Health Organization, and it was around technology for patient safety, right? And it's the same conversation we're having right now. It's like, there's so many solutions out there, you're getting bombarded. I was saying to Matthew, uh, I don't know, a few days ago, look, I'm getting three emails a day with the new COVID chatbot that some companies built, and you know, or they want to do remote monitoring and all that kind of stuff. And what we did with the WHO was, um, we said, hey, Let's not actually look at the solution. Let's actually define the problem. And what we did on that, and this is where it comes to what Ian was talking about, was around the clinical care pathway, right? So whether it's a clinical care pathway for primary care or it's for elective care, where I'm going to go and do a gastric bypass on a patient, or it's for emergent care, or if it's for um, you know, long-term Alzheimer's care or um, end-of-life clinical care pathways. What we do, and this is the exact model that we use within our ventures group, um, we have a company come in and say, okay, this is something for depression or gestational diabetes or whatever it is and say, 
we get the clinicians and the administrators in the room and say, just map the pathway for us. Just, just tell us, let's get a very, very long whiteboard and let's just go and map the pathway, right? And then close your eyes and tell me what ideal looks like, you know, Nirvana, right? It's beautiful, like from a provider's perspective, from a patient perspective, from a societal perspective, and let's map that on the top as well. And then let's put a Y axis on the side of what are the things that we're gonna measure that take us from current state to ideal state, right? And then what I do with the teams is say, which are your biggest priorities? Well, where are the areas where, you know, it's this here and a bit of this here, or which are the most important things? And what are the things that we should be measuring on that? And then we go back to company X and we say, look, this is what we really need. And if you guys either have 20% of that or 80% of that and are prepared to work with us to co-develop this. And then the second part of it, going to Jess's comment was, we then don't say, hey, yeah, we're going to take this across the enterprise, across our you know, uh, 14 hospitals. And so we do a pilot. We do it in two primary care sites or three hospitals or five urgent care sites and whatever. And we do a pilot for a fixed amount of time, a few months with predetermined metrics, which is based on that original whiteboard mm -hmm. exercise. We're just closing up a study we're doing on gestational diabetes with a company in the UK. And we were actually talking about that whiteboard exercise that we did over a year ago. And where are we? Can we look back? And that kind of gives us our frame of reference. And if we're successful in that pilot, then we will scale across the enterprise and then we'll support this and take this out to New Jersey or uh, the Northwest and so forth. And if not, then the pilot deserves to die. And that might be our fault that we own it, it might be the company, but you know, death by pilot is not a bad thing, right? Death by pilot. I'm not a fan of piloting to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people don't want to use that phrase, do Michael, uh, we have heard something from you over the years about uh, quality quality care pathways. Yes, well, so, <laughs> so patient my, safety, my, maybe. My, my quality walk, love what Raj was saying. Right. Uh, so, so uh, I'm going to give you a bravo on that. I wanted to broaden the discussion just a bit because when I was listening to Grace talking about how the, the, the patient is not involved and also uh, about, uh, I think this group is pretty well allergic to uh, simple solutions. Oh, it's all technology. Oh, it's all consumerism. Uh, just the right deductible will solve everything. Right. Uh, and, and one of the things I, I wrote a, a piece for the British Medical Journal a few years ago saying beyond patient centered care to collaborative health. And I think it sort of uh, uh, comes here because what I talked about when you was shared information, shared engagement and shared accountability. And what that meant was the patient is the hub. Right. Just like if I use Chase Manhattan Bank. I can still use Venmo and it's up to them to deal with that, right? So if I'm the hub of information, that's where it goes and shared engagement, then the patient groups, right? That I'm in the peer review groups with shared accountability, it's up to me to share that information with the healthcare system. Just like when the healthcare system is dealing with tech companies, share that with me, right? I may be employed by someone who has a chronic disease management company. You don't see that electronic medical record at my hospital, shared information, shared engagement with who we have to engage and then shared accountability. And this kind of collaborative health, which does not put patient centeredness at the center, which is you trying to make me your good customer, but puts digital reality, which is in a health 2.0 world, I don't have to stay within your walled garden, right? Um, but we should collaborate and we should share information. And I think if we move towards that eventually, it's gonna address a lot of these issues because frankly, you can't expect expect the chief financial officer at a large healthcare institution to worry about uh, coordinating care and letting the patients sort of know what's gonna happen when they're going to all these other places. That's kind of not their job. But if we put everybody within the same ecosystem, so all of us have the job of sharing, including the patients, including all those other companies out, you know, uh, doing their own little thing somewhere where Best Buy is monitoring my grandmother at home with its remote monitoring system, right? Everybody's got to share, everybody's got to be accountable, everybody's got to engage. That lets us use bricks and mortar when we need to, which goodness knows we certainly need to, virtual when we need to, and whatever else comes in between, whether it's a, a pandemic or, or chronic care. So I think you know we need to kind of think a little bit about a different paradigm, as well as looking at the uh, god awful mess we have today. Uh, Grace, uh, your that sounds to me like it requires a lot of data access and data interoperability, and you have, I think, a lot of healthcare. So tell me what that is, and then uh, 
tell us what you think. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to comment. Love clinical care pathways. Love standardizing because you have these centers of excellence who have pathways who are a model for more community, more rural settings so that we standardize care. So in theory, we have consistency of care no matter where you go to get care. However, what is a clinical endpoint of success inside the four walls of medicine might not necessarily be what is considered success from a patient. So we can tell Mrs. Smith that we wanna lower her A1C and she needs to stop smoking and she needs to stop doing X, Y, and Z. But what is important to Mrs. Smith is being able to go to her son's wedding and dance and wear this beautiful dress. And both sides can be met with a standardized pathway but this is why I say patient centricity is dead because it's just a buzzword. What we really need to build our models and our digital health strategies and our clinical strategies and patient empowerment strategies is to support life focused care because not everyone can achieve health. People are born with some catastrophic things, okay? So you're already with the words we're using, leaving them out of the equation. They're never going to achieve health, but that doesn't mean they don't wanna live their best life where they are considering their circumstances. So if you change the lens with empathy and really try to understand what people, what's meaningful to people, um, people think in terms of events or milestones um, uh, within the context of their family, which encompasses social determinants of health. I mean, there's a lot of facets here. And when you think of life-focused care, we can achieve that. But again, you have to talk to the patients and we really don't talk enough with the family. Take the sandwich generation, people who are taking care of their own families, their own health conditions, and as well as aging parents. That care partner has a wealth of information and input on how to make these things work and what tools they would, would beg and die for on their knees to have to make it easier. We're not talking to them. So we can talk all about standardizing clinical care, care pathways, but if it doesn't work in the real world, it's going to lead to more patient blaming. Well, you know, the patient wasn't tech savvy, the patient didn't want to do this, the patient was not adherent. Um, clinical pathways that standardize certain prescriptions that are just financially not affordable to most patients. And we don't flag that until, um, you know, three months later at the follow-up, we know that Mrs. Jones wasn't taking this medication because she couldn't afford it because it wasn't on her formulary. Um, you know, a lot of work to do there. Yeah. Uh, Raj, real quick, you've got a, an investment in the company I talked with yesterday called DinaCare, which is doing yeah. some of that stuff in the home. Did you say a little bit about right. what Grace just said? Yeah, I, I, I just want to respond to Grace because you said some really, really critically important things. So um, part of my clinical practice is as a bariatric surgeon. And you can imagine I see patients who have tried everything, are uh, yeah. completely despondent and, you know, in whether they're in their 20s, 40s or 60s, um, you know, they're really, really at, uh, uh, at the last mile. And it's exactly what you said, you know, so we have, if I do a gastric bypass on you, this is how much weight you're going to lose. And this is how your diabetes is going to get better. And when I actually empathize with the patients and ask them, what is it that you actually want? It's, I want to be able to go on a white bike ride with my eight year old. I want to go to the swimming pool with my teenage daughter and not feel embarrassed and her feel embarrassed because I'm there. It's exactly that. And the challenge on that is, you know, when we do quality reporting, how do you measure that? How, you know, and, and that's a somewhat of a rhetorical question. Like it's easy to measure all the quality metrics if we did this many patients and so forth. So I'd love to have a conversation with you on just how do you measure that stuff? It's, uh, uh, it, it absolutely is the right thing uh, to do. So, um, but uh, uh, Matt, just going back to you. So yeah, we work with a company called DinaCare. They're a connected care company in the post-acute care space. They're a startup uh, um, based out of Chicago. Uh, really, really terrific uh, team led by this guy called Ashish, who has a background in healthcare interoperability. And really the, uh, the issue that he found, um, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, is his father passed away about five years ago. And it was, again, the same thing we're talking about, like, where is the connectedness, right? This little silly thing that I had about getting my COVID test was like a hundred, a thousand times worse for him and his family. And he just went, this is the business I'm in and I can't figure this out. And just getting kind of, you know, home care services, um, DME and, and social work and so forth. So he built this company with um, uh, doing some really great work with them. And, and specifically um, uh, right now, what they're doing is connecting up case managers within the hospital to the, um, the post-acute care workers, whether it's social workers, whether it's DME, whether it's home health workers and so forth. And it's amazing that you have this huge blind spot of using faxes and phone calls and it's so efficient, inefficient. And some of our case managers now just go, oh my God, I can actually see in real time these patients that 
I'm getting ready to discharge and they're getting their home care services and, you know, wow, it's enabling me to care again, right? It's, it's almost, you know, the, the providers getting that empathy back because they can really uh, be part of the, uh, uh, the patient journey. And so what we've worked with them, they've done this really kind of uh, rapid thing of um, specific to COVID. Um, we haven't talked too much about that, but we have um, obviously a lot of patients that have come through our, uh, our system that are COVID positive, then they're ready to go home. We want to monitor them when they go home. We want to know what's happening. Are they getting fevers? Are they getting sicker again? What's happening to their O2 sats? Are there other folks within uh, their environment, whether they're at home or so forth? And so Dina Care built this kind of uh, chatbot thing. We now have um, 300 patients who we've discharged who are now on this. They get a, a daily uh, text. There's some AI that underpins that. Um, some of those patients have been flagged by the nurses. There is no way that we would be able to monitor in real time these 300 patients. But I think that goes back to the other part of it is you're not just going to send them home with this Dina Care chatbot and go, see ya, that's it. Now you've got everything. It's about kind of having that connectedness of you were in the hospital. This is what happened. Now we get line of sight from home. And if you need to come back and we need to uh, focus on you again, then we can do that. And we can also focus on your your family around that as well. So we're really proud of the work they've done with us uh, just over the last few weeks on this. So thank you, um, Matt, on that. Yeah, and no, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I would like to take that and, and basically try to figure out how do you magnify this whole conversation, how do you magnify that? Because then you can get to, to care where people need it. Um, we've got a few minutes left. While we've been on this call, I mean, I've, I've got my tweet stream going on the side. There's a bunch of crazy shit happening in the world, right? The Michigan State House has been <laughs> raided, stormed by a bunch of armed men. Great. Uh, the governor of Maryland is importing tests from Korea and has sent out the Maryland state troopers and the Maryland National Guard to surround the plane when it comes down to stop the Fed stealing the tests. And apparently this happened in Massachusetts, where but the Fed stole a bunch of the PPE that, kept, that Charlie Baker, the governor there, had got in. Uh, you know, you've got that all happening. Meanwhile, Apple just put its dividend up and their stock price and the other big tech companies' stock prices seem to be going up while the rest of the world is, is falling apart. So against the background where you've got all this random stuff that's hard to understand and seems to have no connection to each other and no connection to reality going on, and we're having this nice conversation about how we should change health policy and change the, the, the roles. Of, <clears throat> is anything that we're talking about realistic that may get put into wider policies or wider or or wider society in the next little bit, or are we just going to have to go through this great time for a long time or something comes out? Michael, you're like, you're... I mean, since, since the current administration uh, has politicized everything and evidence doesn't count unless it serves the political purposes, the answer is no, and not on a federal level. Uh, 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 you know, if, like I said, if, if, if social distancing is whether you believe the, the fearless leader, then the more complicated stuff may be done by states, may be done by municipalities, may be done by others, but there is no national health policy that's really gonna to respond to anything other than access and, and cost, right? Keep hospitals from going bankrupt, uh, keep uh, consumers from going bankrupt, keep people from being bankrupted by their healthcare costs at least before November. And, and uh, you know, that, that's kind of the state of an emergency. And, and to be honest, um, that, may very well be appropriate. I mean, uh, uh, for people who are without a job, without an income and worried about getting sick and dying, uh, they're probably not worried about uh, some of the finer points of healthcare policy for a while. So um, we're not gonna have long-term planning from the federal government. We may get it elsewhere. And then after things shake out a little bit, uh, hopefully we'll learn, uh, we'll learn some lessons. Uh, and this is both regrettable if you're a wonk and understandable if you're just a, an average person, I'm afraid. Ian, I want to jump on you. This we were on the like the first one of these, and you said, "Oh, we're going to be into the second year of the Trump administration, and eventually the you know the fifth year, the fifth fifth term of the Ivanka administration in, in thirty years." Uh, the, one of the things I've noticed is that you know the death rates we're seeing from COVID are very high amongst you know seniors. My 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 uh, someone was joking me the other day that uh, well you know Trump's constituency is dying off. I did point out that a lot of the deaths are amongst minorities, so it may not be his constituency right. dying off. But I mean. There does seem to be, you know, uh, the numbers for Trump and aren't looking so good. I know it's really early days. There's a whole bunch of stuff with Biden and the sex of sword and God knows what else we've got to get through. And November is a long way away. But are you seeing any anything that sort of changes your mind about whether, what is going to mean for the long term? We're going to get back to a Democrat who believes in long term sensible planning and we're going to have that? Or is it 
never going to happen. I, I mean, I, I, as Michael was talking and as you're asking a question, I, I, my short answer is it depends. You know, I've been working on these uh, like seven different scenarios of combinatrix of various factors. Um, I won't bore you with, but, but I mean, it depends very much on the bounce back on employment. Uh, but I think, I think actually, I take a more positive view for the longer run. I think it's out of this kind of conversation. I don't think there's one one simple answer, but I do think the combination of large health systems like Raj's, you know, who are doing what they're doing, that the healthcare ecosystem of startups, which I not to belittle them, I mean, I, even though I, I give them a hard time, but that's where a lot of the new ideas for this transformation are going to come from. Um, and then the real question is aligning the payment systems going forward. And I think the forcing function is going to be what I've been saying to everybody I talked to in the last four weeks is January 2020 was the absolute height of private health insurance coverage in America. Uh, and from here on in, I, ca I can't conceive of a scenario where that doesn't go down as a relative share and that government pay payment, particularly managed Medicaid and Medicare Advantage doesn't go up. Um, and so uh, I think the forcing function on, say, transformation towards a value system incorporating these things will be driven by that fact. Uh, uh, and, and that's why I said at the outset, my, the thing I'm monitoring is this bounce back uh, as to whether we just go back to the game of charging 300% of Medicare for surgeries. Uh, and if that's not the case, then I think we've got to find a different future. So Ian, what do you make of the ACOs losing money uh, in a torrent wanting to drop out and all the rest of that? I mean, uh, how are we going to keep value-based care from being uh, sunk by all of this and just go back to shoveling money at the bottom? Well, it's, it's a real issue. And, and I, I agree that there are pockets where some have done very poorly and some have do well. I mean, I think it comes back to reinsurance uh, right. corners right. and those kind of policy responses. I mean, there are technical fixes. I mean, the Millman thing I, I heard earlier in the week, their forecast basically is that total healthcare costs in 2020 will be down year over year from 2019 by as much as half a, you know, 500 million at one, one of their outside scenarios, uh, which sounds correct to me because I think the, the elective hole I'm hearing in places is 30, 40, 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, um, oh, okay. Grace, I don't. I don't think it's restarting as fast as the surgeons think. But I, I defer to Raj on that. <laughs> Raj, the salaried guy, the big jack and make something. He doesn't care about going in there and doing your uh, gastric bypass. I can tell you Grace, something about that. Uh, uh, Grace, I'll get you in, and then we're going to go around the horn to, to wrap up. Uh, well, you know what we didn't touch on is any kind of the information and data that's coming out from the scientific research perspective. We had a huge uproar yesterday with Gilead Sciences and right. the preliminary data coming out from the Remdesivir, and we're all looking for more information there. I mean, people want to know what doctors and and caregivers are going to have in their toolkit to care for us when we get sick and our loved ones end up in the hospital. A vaccine is a long ways away. So um, all incremental improvements, I think, are desperately needed. So we need more information there. Yeah, we also, um, I mean, just on the information, but we've had a lot this week about what I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, got beaten up by e patient day four, which is what is total death rate compared to normal and expected? And there's been some articles in the FT and the Economist looking at that. And Looks like we're way, way above that. So, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this is the COVID thing is still pretty bad, even though people are starting opening up. All right, we're coming right to the end. So I want to give us everyone the sort of 20 second thing of what's going to happen next week. So I'm going to start with uh, Michael. What's going to happen next week, real quick? We'll have more scientific uh, discoveries and information, which will either be uh, twisted into the Tinkerbell version of clap your hands and everything will be better or uh, will give us a more realistic uh, uh, version. So the question is, do we get Jared as Tinkerbell or do we get Fauci uh, as uh, uh, the one who says he does not believe in Tinkerbell? We'll, we'll see what happens. Jessica, next week, what are you expecting? I have no idea. I couldn't even <laughs> begin to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it couldn't be crazier than this week, right? All right. 
Uh, Raj, your ideas for what we're going to see next week? Yeah, I think um, we're actually planning to start up doing some surgeries next week um, uh, uh, at Jefferson. And the interesting thing is, so I applied for my New Jersey state license. I'm only licensed in Pennsylvania. I applied for it yesterday. Literally within three minutes, I got the letter from the attorney general through the email. Someone had looked at it and I got temporary license for 180 <laughs> days to be able wow. to practice in New Jersey. Welcome. It normally takes three to six months, right? So I can now cross the river and go and operate. So if we're going to be restarting surgery, I think it's there's going to be a conversation around practicing across state lines. I don't see us going back from this. I think it's a tremendous move and I'd love to see how we're going to uh, progress this for, forward. We're going to send you on a house call to Grace up the, up the uh, what is it, up the I-95. Sure. <laughs> uh, Ian, next week. Um, I, I, I am firmly convinced Donald Trump will not wear the mask. <laughs> I'm still grumpy with my so And the, I don't think it's got anything to do with the face, it's the hair. There's no <laughs> way you can get the mask on and off without completely without the hair. The hair. That's what it's about. Let's be honest. I'm not sure why Pence didn't wear it in that case. <laughs> All right. My sleep round for next week and then we'll wrap is that, uh, you know who else came out with earnings and did pretty well? It's the big insurers, right, who are spending less. They're going to make more money in the in future off managed Medicare and managed Medicare, uh, Medicare bondage and managed Medicaid. Um, and yet, you know, as, as Ian just said, we're going to be down massively in the uh, in the last one. Grace, did I do your, well, I didn't do your rap. Hang on. I'll do one after you. Grace, do your, what are you expecting next week? More credible science and data. That's what I'm looking for. Less politics, less arguing and like tit for tat and about who did and who didn't. Science, let science and the experts lead the way. That is a very ambitious and hopeful. Uh, <laughs> I think in the current. <laughs> so uh, I think that's it. I, I think we, we'll be, we will be over the next week, you know, the conversation, and we don't have uh, Anish Kokor on this week, but there's been a bunch of, of conversation you know, about what from some pretty smart infectious disease folks, Dr. Jeff Klausner, who I know, who used to be uh, ran the sexual health department at the public health in San Francisco and is now UCLA, has been saying, you know, closing down for this sort of infectious disease doesn't make sense. There's a bunch of sort of deviant doctors in that sense. And I think that you'll get some science coming on the open up carefully side more quickly than you expect. Having said that, we're all still following, you know, the Walter Chronicles and elsewhere from UCSF and looking at the, the those uh, data coming out of New York City. There's a hell of a long way to go in this thing. And what opening up, we're starting to realize that opening up does not look like we're all going to be back at the baseball, you know, cheering on the Giants or whoever the hell has a crowd coming to them, you know, in the next, in the next few weeks. And uh, this is very bad news, given we have three Brits on the phone. Very bad news for Liverpool, because I don't think that English soccer season is going to start up any time and they're never going to win their championship. Very sad. It'll be 30 more years till they win a Premier League title. What can we say? <laughs> All right. With that, I want to thank the gang. It's been a very entertaining uh, group today. I want to thank uh, my uh, special guest, Raj Agarwal, all the way from uh, Jefferson in Philadelphia, and Jester Massa, all the way from uh, um, the Bay Area. Well, uh, you know, new, new, on this, new on this, but not new on the TCB by any means. Uh, Grace Cordovano from New Jersey, Michael Millinson from Chicago, and Ian Morrison from the wilds of Menlo Park in uh, Northern California. That's been the THCB gang. I want to thank you all for being on. I want to thank you all for watching and listening, whether you're watching live or hearing this on the podcast. Um, it's the THCB gang tuning out on April the 30th. We'll be back one week from today, um, same time, 1 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Sorry, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. <laughs>